Just before we get started with the episode today, I do want to give a quick plug to a new channel that I'm doing called Decoding the Unknown. It's all about solving some of history's greatest mysteries. We look at a whole bunch of stuff like did a book predict the sinking of the Titanic? What really happened to the Russian hikers in the Dyatlov Pass? And what happened to the Mary Celeste? And because it's a channel from me, we're not going to just accept that, oh, it was ghosts. Yeah, it's definitely ghosts. That's what's happening. Um, no, no, no. We're going to try and really figure out what happened. It's a casual, laid-back show, and I think if you like my stuff, you'll probably enjoy it as well. It's available on YouTube. There's probably a link below. It's called Decoding the Unknown. And now into today's video. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host, Simon. What I'm doing right there, preparing my pronunciation dictionary, because we're heading over to Pakistan for today's episode, where... I am sure there are things that I will need to look up. Sometimes, though, I just won't. I don't know, I don't know why I say that. I'm probably just not going to bother and we're just going to rattle through and I'm going to get them all wrong. And you guys, unfortunately, are <laughs> just going to have to live with it. Or just not know. If you're from Pakistan, though, I do apologize for the, the butchering that is going to occur. Javad Iqbal, Pakistani Justice, is the title of today's episode. Um, Let's just... With a title like Pakistani Justice, though, I get the feeling I might be upsetting the entire nation of Pakistan. So, uh, let's see how we do. What happens here is Callum writes me a script. I'm going to read it. And uh, then afterwards, of course, as always, Jen. If you're watching this video, she adds the images. If you're listening to the podcast version, well, she adds the music. She does it all. And let's get into it. If you compare modern crime and punishment to the systems of days gone by, you'd be forgiven for thinking that condemned criminals have a pretty cushy nowadays. Yeah, as rough as prison would be. And it's like, I don't know, like you think of prison, it's like what do you think of, you know, like rooms without windows, showers where, you know, you drop the soap and all this kind of stuff. I don't know, it's probably just based on movies. But also prison's not nice. But as we all know, and as discussed regularly, the past is the worst, and it was almost always worse in the past. I was reading about that, or doing a video about that prison where uh, the guy with the man in the iron mask, or whatever it was, it's called, like in France. I said, oh my God, don't get stuck in like French prisons hundreds of years ago. It was not a good place to be. The history of capital punishment is rife with gruesome methods of execution that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. For it depends, it depends how bad that enemy is, doesn't it, Callum? Uh, for example, fall foul of the king in 14th century England. You might find yourself hung, drawn, and quartered, or in plain English, dragged behind a horse to the gallows, hanged half to death, mutilated and chopped up into four pieces, then mounted on a castle wall for the peasantry to gawk at. At least they got four pieces, so you know. So uh, disperses the crowd a little bit, which is, uh, this is just extremely f***ed up. Or piss off a 17th century admiral, and he might order you to be keel-hauled, tossed overboard with a rope tied to your feet, dragged along the bottom of the ship over and over again to be scraped to death by all the barnacles and splinters. Oh my god, that is horrible. I've heard of this. I just thought it was a punishment, and then I was like, well, what's the big problem? The boat's really smooth underneath. <laughs> it's like, oh no, yeah. This was also back in the day when boats were made of wood and also, I guess, barnacles were there. I guess there are barnacles on modern boats as well. So, look, it's not a good time. Or how about this last one? I promise. Besmirch the honor of a priest's daughter in ancient Israel and you'll be force-fed a nice, refreshing jug of molten lead for your last meal. Oh, my God. Like, with that, what's, what's the, is it Game of Thrones, which I've never seen, but I have seen or, like, heard of or seen pictures of, like, where they pour the molten lead or whatever it is or molten gold down someone's throat to kill them and like that is extremely intense guys do we have to do that you might think that this is a thing of the past but today we're taking a look at how all this historic gore was given a run for its money by a sentence issued by one judge in pakistan just 20 years ago 20 years ago is 2001 good lord that feels i mean yeah it's a really long ass time ago but it's also like it's not a long ass time ago compared to like the keel hauling thing or uh pissing off the 14th century king. On the March the 16th, 2000, a Lahore magistrate passed down a sentence upon one particularly reviled convict, which included a metal chain, gratuitous dismemberment, and even a bath of acid. Oh my god, judge. I don't feel like judges should be able to decide the punishment. I mean, they should be able to decide the punishment, like death, but they shouldn't be like, okay, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> Let's get creative with this one, because we decided that lethal injection isn't enough. <laughs> We're going to torture you a little bit first. 
So what in the hell does someone have to do to invoke this kind of Old Testament wrath from a sworn-in judge? Well, as you probably imagine, it requires that you be one of the most awful, contemptible, downright sickening individuals that the world has ever seen. Right now, I'm like, look, even if this guy was some sort of pedophile child killer, which is always not what I go to for like the worst criminals, it's like, I wouldn't want him to be tortured to death. I'm not even sure I would want him put to death. But I mean, I would consider the being put to death thing, but I definitely don't want him to be like, I don't want his death to be gratuitous. Let's just chop his head off and be done with it. Or lethal injection him or whatever people do these days. I guess not chopping off the heads, but you know what I mean. Which is about as accurate an epitaph as you can get for Javad Iqbal, Pakistan's most gruesome serial killer. Hidden Victims Throughout 1999, the city of Lahore was plagued with a series of mysterious disappearances which went all but completely unnoticed by the public. Dozens of the country's 1.5 million street kids went missing. Oh my god, he, had a, he, is, a murder, he is a child murderer. Not good. Uh, went missing while begging at the monuments and shrines around the city. And in many cases, nobody even noticed they were gone. Okay, so there's 1.5 million of them and a, and a fraction have gone missing. At first I was like, wait, this guy has got 1.5 million? <laughs> no. Unfortunately, when, you're, when you've had a rougher start in life as these kids have had, nobody's putting you on the side of a milk carton. Most were orphans or runaways, teens whose parents took months to report their disappearances. Invisible to the rest of society, these kids were the ideal target for a sadistic serial killer who was in the midst of a marathon killing spree that would rock Pakistan to its core. It wasn't until the last week of November of that year that the nation even had an inclination that something was amiss when the killer himself sent a full confession to the local police station. Oh my god, that just makes you wonder, like, how many serial killers are out there? Like, because obviously there's tons of missing persons where the bodies just never found, the people are never found, and obviously they've just been killed, or like a percentage of them have been killed, for sure. And they've just never caught these people, because they're not stupid or they don't make a mistake, like all of the criminals that we seem to come on contact with in Casual Criminalist. The rest are out there. Maybe they're listening to this podcast right now. Your days are numbered. Maybe. Maybe not. Probably not, to be honest. <laughs> As we just discussed, probably not. This wasn't some Zodiac-style coded cipher either. The guy gave his full name, listed his crimes, and even told them his home address. Included were pictures of the missing kids and other evidence of his deeds. Serial killers often love an audience, so maybe he was irritated at the complete and utter apathy of the ones who were meant to be chasing him. If so, they were about to disappoint him all over again. The cop who opened the letter allegedly read it through, immediately decided it was a hoax, and told tossed it right into the trash. How about this cop, right? He gets this letter, be like, yo, 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 John, John, come over, or whatever the Pakistani equivalent of John is. John, come over here and take a look at this letter and run it into the database. Just see if any of it matches up, just in case. Okay? Just go do that. It'd take five minutes. And then they would have this serial killer. And it killed less kids, which would be nice. Again, brilliant police work there, Pakistan. And I'm not saying, you know, it's not just Pakistan. It's a, a regular theme on Casual Criminalist, isn't it? This might sound like gross negligence, but you have no idea how much work is involved in a serial killer case, and this guy had plans for the weekend. Was he supposed to cancel the family picnic to go avenge the death of some orphans? Don't be ridiculous. Or I'm not asking him to do that. Look, I know I don't expect police to work all the time, even if there's a serial killer on the loose and he could kill someone on the weekend. I understand that the police need time off, because then they'll be well rested and better at catching serial killers. But how about you just put it on the just little note? Just put it in the inbox. Be like deal with serial killer potential letter on monday monday morning then you got something to do for the whole week brilliant thankfully the killer was already familiar with the unconventional procedures of pakistani law enforcement so they also sent out an insurance police the same confession letter was also delivered to the mailroom of newspaper the daily jang on december the second the journalists weren't quite so nonchalant about the claims of mass murder especially with bold statements like i have killed a hundred beggar children and put their bodies in a container Oh. This is going to be a bad one. If he's really killed 100 people, that is putting him up there with the most prolific killers that we've seen on Casual Criminalist. There was Shipman, who was into the 200, into 200 plus. But it's very rare for someone to break 100. The journalist decided to take the killer up on his invitation. Come to my apartment on Ravi Road and see for yourself. Shortly thereafter, they turned up outside the dank little three-bedroom home. This was the residence of Javed Iqbal, local sex offender, who was soon to become one of the most reviled names in Pakistani history. So not only 
was this guy getting away with it all and writing a letter to the police he was also a registered seemingly i don't know if they have registered sex offenders or whatever but he was a local sex offender you know like the local shop <laughs> local sex offender every town's got one statistically probably true who was javad iqbal Born in 1956, Javad Iqbal Mughal was the sixth child of eight from a wealthy family in Lahore. His father was a successful businessman, and as a result, little Javad was provided for comfortably all throughout his life. When he went off to study in the Shadbar district of Lahore, his dad purchased not one, but two villas for the pampered little prince to stay in. Holy <laughs> who needs... It's like, what? It's like, yeah, well, there's my villa, and then I've got my spare villa. You know, just, uh, for n just because... From everything I've read, I get the distinct impression that throughout his whole life, Javad was the sort of person who'd never heard the word no. His father bankrolled him through a series of business endeavors, starting with a steel casing business, which he ran out of one of the villas. If your dad's super rich and you can start whatever business you want, you know, because it doesn't matter if it fails because old daddy's paying, is steel ca steel casting really the... Uh, sorry, I said steel casing at first. Is steel casting really the, the one to go for? That sounds like messy and hot. I wouldn't do that. I'd start a YouTube channel. Ah. This was ba basically a paper thin ploy for Javad now in his 20s to employ a group of teenage strays to come and live with him, an arrangement which he would maintain for his entire adult life, changing the roster over the years. Everyone knew there was something untoward going on, but for the most part, Javad had the wealth and status to deflect any suspicion. Wait, <laughs> what's that got to do with anything? Why should we be less suspicious of wealthy people? It's like, they could be criminals as well? <laughs> Clearly. Look at Javad. He's got like some sort of weird cult house going already. And we're barely on page three. Now, as you might know, Pakistan isn't exactly on the Lonely Planet's top 10 queer travel destinations list. Javad was always going to be a target of suspicion for his sexual preferences, but that is not what I'm taking issue with here. It's the fact that he paid a group of underage boys to live with him like a mad sex pest vegan, and he called them his boys. <laughs> this is so fed up. This is, it is like some Oliver shit, isn't it? Except. Fagin is a sex criminal. Javad and his crew of half a dozen miners could often be seen cruising around town in his fancy cars. When friends and family pointed out how weird it was for a grown man to keep that kind of company, he would kick off and demanded they stay away from his house and his servants. As the years wore on, he gained a well-deserved reputation as a proper skin-crawling creep, and his predilections were pretty much an open secret. But <laughs> he was rich and he had status. Let's just ignore him. He's probably fine. Ah. Throughout the 80s, Javad would acquire teenage pen pals through children's magazines. Dude, that is so sick. Set up the dis that and not like sick, man. But like sick in the head. Like what's wrong with you? Like what are you up to? Children's magazines. Oh, he is a murderous pedophile. <laughs> Set up the district's first video game arcade to lure in victims and used his father's money to fund a series of other ventures like Sunnyside School, which, given his reputation, had an enrollment rate of exactly zero. Wait, what's an enrollment rate? Isn't that how many people join the school? Wouldn't he want people to join the school so he can be, like, a pedophile towards them? Wait. This is crazy. This is like as if a pedophile won the lottery and was in, like, a lawless state where they were like, Ah, it's probably fine. It's probably fine. It's not fine. Uh, it's, as, it's not as if this went unnoticed by the law. Okay. Okay, here we go. But Iqbal's father was always able to foot the bill in order to save the family name. Well, these aren't civil offenses, are they? It's not like, oh, he did something wrong, so he got a fine for, like, improperly manufacturing his steel casing or whatever. No, no, no. He's a predator. And I feel like that's called a criminal case, where you don't just pay. Maybe you have to pay a little bit, but you also go to prison. Or maybe take an acid bath. There's... This guy apparently does, which is super intense. And I'm, you know, I'm coming around to give him an acid bath. I'm not really. I'm definitely not really. I don't believe in torturing criminals to death. That just seems way too intense. Every time a parent or neighbor reported him to the police through the 80s, old Javi managed to dodge criminal charges on the strength of his father's reputation. But his arrest in 1990, good, would be the last time Daddy Iqbal was around to dig him out of a hole. Shortly afterwards, he passed away, meaning Javad was now vulnerable. The next time he was brought in in 1992, his time in jail was markedly, markedly less cushy. Charged with sodomy, the cops allegedly beat him to a pulp during interrogations and threatened to kill him and cover up his death. The only problem there... I've got no problem with having... <laughs> like, 
<laughs> the police brutality. God, no, I'm like, yeah, that's no problem. All of that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I don't want him tortured to death, but, you know, a little slap around the face by a cop for this guy. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I'll let that go. But uh, the charge they got him with was sodomy rather than being a pedophile. Brilliant. His mother, who is extremely close with, attempted to throw money at the problem like back in the good old days, but without his father's political clout, it wasn't quite so easy. That old impunity, it seemed, had now expired. Javad was sentenced to a public thrashing. Oh my god, Pakistan. I mean, I know, I, it's always one of those things where it's like, Simon, Simon, don't judge the other countries by your own, like, Western moral standards. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I get it. I get it. But how about we don't thrash people? I didn't even realize that thrashing was a word other than like we thrash. I mean, I know it is, because but really I thought it was exclusively used in sports. Like we absolutely thrashed that other team. Not we absolutely thrashed the pedophile in the town square. That's pretty intense. He was also sentenced to six months in prison. On the inside, he claims that he was brutally attacked by the police, telling a Lahore paper, I was so badly beaten that my head was crushed by backbone broken and I was left crippled. I hate this world. Javad's mother passed away from a heart attack while he was in custody, and he blamed the state for driving her to an early grave. Wait, but you committed the crimes. Then they arrested you. I hate to break it to you, Javi, but this is on you, mate. Because, as we'll see, the pampered little prince was pathologically incapable of taking responsibility. Ah, yes, there we go. <laughs> Callum and I, same page. Humiliated and defeated, Javad saw himself at war with the world and everyone in it upon his release from prison. The final breaking point came in September 1998, when he and one of his boys got into an altercation with a masseuse and another employee. Javad had his head kicked in, probably quite deservedly, and a sizable amount of rupees were lifted from his wallet. What he, When he reported this to the police, they dismissed his complaint and slapped him with a fresh sodomy charge. <laughs> yes, mate. If you're involved with crimes and then some crime happens to you, I got some bad news for you. In fact, it doesn't matter if the other crimes were worse. You can't go to the police because they'll be like, yo, 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 wait, did you just say you were involved in some like sodomy with a boy? in your room with a masseuse and another individual because you came to us and you came to us asking about the stolen rupees mate <laughs> you're under arrest he was more furious at the establishment than ever and vowed to take revenge on them for daring to make him face the consequences of his actions uh, this is what happens when your parents are too rich it's that uh oh my god there was that in that insane case which maybe we could even cover on casual criminalist about the kid who was uh what did he have affluenza the parents' lawyer argued that he had affluenza because he was like drunk and high driving his car and then he crashed it and he killed two of his friends and some other people and he got away with it. And then he was still a dickhead and he tried and then he did something else and he got arrested but then he fled and all of this stuff and it's like, oh my God, if you are rich, just you've got to make extra hard. I, I feel like if you're just regular, you know, it feels like if you're super poor, I feel like it's easy to fuck up your kids because they don't have enough if you're super rich, it's easy to fuck up your kids because they have way too much and they think they're untouchable. I think it's good to just be in the middle. <laughs> or if you're either rich or poor, you got to work super hard not to f Or like, just, just don't, okay? Just don't make them feel like they're invulnerable. All right, here we go. Moving on. <laughs> Life lessons with Simon over for today. I just want to say... The attack left him in hospital for three weeks. Oh no! And none of his family were willing to foot the bill. By the time he got out, he discovered they had sold off his fancy cars and property, property to cover the costs, leaving him comparatively broke. That's when the 42-year-old sex offender and his remaining employees employees in quotation marks downsized from their luxury pool villa to a dingy little three-bed apartment on Ravi Road, Lahore. Which, almost exactly one year later, was where a group of journalists pulled up in the early hours of the morning to make the most unsettling discovery of their careers. In this way, I would take revenge against the world I hated. If the letter was to be believed, Javad had decided to wage war against the world in the most horrific way imaginable. He claimed that this little concrete apartment building was the site of one of the most atrocious mass murders ever orchestrated by an individual, a parting gift to the world before he would take his own life. In his confessions, he wrote that his killing spree began several months after being released from hospital. He and his four boys would prowl the streets looking for victims to lure back to their lair. There, Javad would feed them, ask them about their lives, 
and take their photographs. The letter outlined how he and his gang of young kids would then sexually assault the victims, then strangle them with a metal chain. In some cases, he would put on a mask and force them to inhale a mixture of acid and cyanide while sleeping. To dispose of the bodies, they would dismember them and toss the remains into a vat of hydrochloric acid, then dispose of whatever was left down a sewer grate which flowed into the nearby Ravi River. His goal was ostensibly to get back at the cops for corruptly mishandling his many criminal cases and to make 100 mothers cry the same way his own mother was forced to cry for him before her death. I don't think your mother was crying for you. Oh, maybe she was, because she's still your mother. But, ah, oh, dude, you're such a horrible piece of shit. And then, also, how does it make anything even to make someone else cry in the same way that your mother cried? They're just completely innocent bystanders who did nothing to you. This is, yeah, again, why, uh, this comes up so often in casual criminals. It's like, why are we trying to apply logic to these people's brains? <laughs> There's just no point. Because it's like, yeah, what's wrong? Why do they kill people? Because they're broken. They're completely broken in the head and uh, their actions make no sense because they're broken in the head, as mentioned previously. Never mind the fact that his mother was crying about her son being an actual convicted rapist. Apples and oranges, Javid. And yes, you heard correctly, in only six months he claims to have killed an incredible 100 victims on this moronic quest for vengeance, potentially more than any American serial killer in history. To make matters worse, all of his alleged victims were aged 16 or under at the time. If that sounds too horrible to be true, then I'd, no, nah, I'm like, nah, nah, I'm in. I get it. This guy's a psycho and he's totally capable of it and he admitted to it and they're probably going to find some evidence for it. And yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just because I've done like 50 episodes of this casual criminalist or whatever. It's like, yeah, well, it's a pretty screwed up place, isn't it? When the journalist entered the unlocked door of Javad Iqbal's apartment that December day, there was little doubt that his grisly claims were true. A Museum of Murder In anticipation of the intrepid journalist's arrival, Javad had set up placards on the wall elaborating on his confession, not unlike the signs in a museum, explaining the items on display. And that's exactly what the place was, a carefully curated museum of murder, an archive of 100 lives cut short, each one described in excruciating detail. This reminds me of Dexter. The, uh, the the glass slides. Except in Dexter, he was killing people who needed to be needed to be killed. Needed to be killed. He was killing people who escaped justice. And there was some like, yeah, go Dexter. Did I talk about this before? I recently watched this TV show called You, which is about this guy who's a serial killer and he's just a piece of. Shit. Um, I'm not sure if we're supposed to like him because he's an absolutely horrible person. There's no one in the show who I like. I'm just watching it like, what? This is such a piece of. Shit. Everyone, everyone is just so unlikable. But at least with Dexter, he's like doing it for a reason. And the guy in you is just like, nah, he's just like, he's just likes killing. He's just an obsessive killer. Yeah. Oh, okay. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, his death museum. Brilliant. Javad wrote at length on the fate of each victim, some whose blood still stained the walls and floor, and directed the readers towards parcels of clothing which he had kept from each. They were neatly arranged like books in a library, filed in order with handwritten notes slipped in between. It was basically a ready-made evidence locker just waiting to be claimed by the police, who, by the way, had finally decided to stop dicking about and had come over for a bit of a look. This guy's breaking all the rules. He breaks all the casual criminalist rules. He's telling people about his crimes. He's out boasting about his crimes. He's up to all sorts of shit. And, and he's, he's essentially got away with it until he's chosen not to anymore. I'm so depressed, I don't know what I'm doing. Which makes me doubt all of the really important rules that we've established on Casual Criminalist over these past, it's not 50 episodes, but I don't know however many it's been. It's been a lot. It feels like it's been a lot. But uh, he breaks the rules, and now I doubt doubt everything. In his extensive confessions, our misguided freedom fighter, also, wait, how is he a freedom fighter? For his own freedom? <laughs> Dick. Had some choice words for the boys in blue. He claimed his spree was supposed to protest the police system, irregularities in jail, in the jail system in Pakistan, and injustice in other sections of society. Because as everyone knows, social justice reform is only possible if you manage to murder enough people to fill a double-decker bus. You psycho. Amazingly, this unorthodox protest didn't do much to garner support for the Justice for Javad movement. After all, it's fairly tough to get behind a man who's willing to butch people and toss their remains into acid. The final exhibit in Javad Iqbal's immersive serial killer experience was a demonstration of that macabre technique. Two open plastic barrels toward the rear of one of the bedrooms from where a rancid chemical stench was emanating. Inside were the half-dissolved skeletal remains of the last two victims, number 99 and 100, killed just days before. This guy, I feel, is just the most unlikable person 
in every regard. He's like spoiled rich kid, entitled, lives in this stupid villa double house that he wants to make into a business, is a sexual predator of underage boys, uh, flaunts his uh, crimes in the face of the public and the police. Just, yeah, what a total piece of <laughs> When the writers back at the Daily Jiang office typed up their story later that day, one question was at the forefront of everyone's minds. Had Devert actually managed to kill victim 101? Had he, as promised, taken his own life? I get the feeling because he's getting, you know, Callum spoiled it at the beginning that he uh, gets sentenced to death by this judge. He puts him in a bath of acid or whatever. But uh, I get the feeling, so obviously, no, he didn't take his own life. Coward. <laughs> but uh, I wish, I don't know, I mean, it's like that joke about you know broke into the Fuhrer. Hitler broke in you know he did the Hitler did the one heroic thing of his life he broke into the Fuhrer bunker and he killed Hitler um yeah so there's that the manhunt as mentioned at the end of the candid confessions pinned to the wall of his home Javid claims that he planned on drowning himself in the same river river where he had disposed of his victims remains in the days which followed vast stretches of the Rebbe were dra- dragged to no avail dragged or dragged i thought it was dregs but callum writes drags maybe it is dragged where you scrape along the bottom of a river for stuff who knows not important meanwhile parents of missing children from the city and surroundings were invited to pick through the personal effects found that day identifying victim after victim oh my god police can't you do that for us like if that was my kid who'd been murdered in there i'd be like F- that i don't want to just tell me what you found maybe show me a photograph of one thing and i'll confirm it for you and then i never want to think about i just don't want to know like just let me deal with my grief please no as the papers published pictures of devastated mothers and fathers sorting through photographs and clothing public anger boiled over at the lack of progress in finding the killer pictures of the killer were circulated in the papers dozens of his family and friends were detained and interrogated and alerts were passed out to border guards around the region all to no avail it was the biggest manhunt in the country's history but it failed to catch even a whiff of the killer's scent a full month passed before the first break. Two teenagers walked into a Lahore post office in an attempt to cash a traveler's check. They were Muhammad Shadzad and Muhammad Nadine, just 13 and 15 respectively. They admitted to helping Javad escape capture and revealed he had been holed up in a drainage culvert and then a cave for the past four weeks. Their confessions led to the capture of a third accomplice shortly thereafter. Perhaps those checks were the gang's only source of funds, or perhaps Javid simply had a change of heart about ending his own life. Whatever the case, with his underlings in custody, he finally decided to face the music himself. On December 30, 1999, caked in filth and wearing damp, ragged clothes, Pakistan's most wanted serial killer strolled into the office of the Daily Jang paper and announced his surrender with one of the most chilling greetings you're ever likely to hear. Detective! I am Javed Akbar, killer of a hundred children. I hate this world, I am not ashamed of my actions, and I am ready to die. I have no regrets. I killed a hundred children. I could have killed five hundred. This was not the problem. Money was not a problem. But the pledge I had taken was of a hundred children, and I never wanted to violate this. Hold on, let me check the scoreboard. Did old Javad just jump up to the top of our casual criminal leaderboard of legendary scumbags? Remorseless? Check. Child killer? Check. Delusions of grandeur? Check. Ring the bell! I think he's caged it! I mean, yes! I don't, I can't tell you, uh, uh. Callum's here declaring, Congratulations, Mr. Rugbo. You're officially the worst human we've ever featured on the show. Simon will have your medal sent out in the mail this week. I have to say, maybe he is. He's not the most he's not killed the most people, that's for sure. But I think he's probably the worst. I think he's probably the worst. Holy sh that we've done it. This is a this is a hard one to beat. Huge kill counts, kill counts children, also a pedophile. Yeah. Yeah flaunts it definitely i'm i'm with you Colin. this is the worst guy so far <laughs> killer cops and mental magistrates actually hold on a minute you might, uh, might want to hold off on mailing that award i forgot to mention that our reigning champion isn't exactly around anymore to receive it in fact the circumstances surrounding the end of his life are the reason we're talking about it in the first place it's what came after his capture that made the story hit international headlines it's sad that a serial killer of a hundred children doesn't make international maybe it did but like not on the not in the way that it's about to Let's jump back to the newspaper office where he made his surprise surrender in December 1999. Apparently satisfied that his macabre mission was complete, it appears as if he it, it 
as if this was Iqbal's last-ditch gambit to save his own life, or rather to save himself from a torturous death at the hands of the police. He was so distrustful of the cops that he believed capture at their hands would result in an extrajudicial lynching off the record. <laughs> I feel surely that's something you can't get away with, like an actual, you know, lynching, like the murder of a suspect. So you're just like, oh no, <laughs> I know. I kind of also get the fear, didn't it? Oh no, you, the judge is like, oh no, police. Did he accidentally die when you were interrogating him? Oh no, I guess it was an accidental death. What a shame. <laughs> you may go. And that's probably not just, but they have death penalty in Pakistan, I'm going to assume. So uh, he must know what's coming. I mean, what other crimes would they have this for? And that's probably not just baseless paranoia. Just days before, one of his alleged associates had found himself in the custody of Pakistani law enforcement. Not long after being brought in, the teenager tossed himself out of a window, falling to his death. Ah, uh -huh. tossed himself out of a window, huh? A post-mortem suggested that he had been brutally beaten before allegedly ejecting himself from the tower block, which raises a few questions over whose idea this dry, urban high dive was in the first place. Doesn't raise questions. He was thrown out of the window. There's absolutely no doubt. <laughs> And even if he wasn't, they tortured him so badly that he killed himself. Which is, uh, if you're torturing someone so badly that they kill themselves, pretty sure that's murder. Let's be honest, I'm not here to defend the reputation of Pakistani police. There's a reason the country is ranked 124th on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, a measure of how much the citizenry trusts their own public institutions. You don't hit triple, you don't hit triple digits on that scoreboard without just a little bit of torture. Yeah, I mean, that is that is fairly corrupt. And by fairly corrupt, I mean, that's how you get to be 124th. I bet number one is always like Finland and stuff, number one. Or Finland, Sweden, you know, those countries in Northern, De in Northern Europe that have their shit together. I'm pretty sure the UK is not very good. Probably Czech Republic's a little bit worse. <laughs> that was a story. This was a good few years ago now where the health minister, like the minister of health, like in charge of health, he was uh, in the Czech Republic. There was, he was accused of like bribery because the police found just t millions of crowns of cash, just cash. I think they were in wine boxes in his house and he was just like, no idea how that got there. And he was, he was sentenced to prison for like six years. He's still in prison right now. That, that was fairly intense. I bet Czech Republic probably dropped a few places on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, which is a mouthful, by the way, that year. I've got to look up, like, where are we, where, okay. So yeah, just as I expect, Denmark, New Zealand, Finland, Singa Singapore, huh? Singapore, Sweden, Switzerland, all right up there at the top. UK, down in number 11. Uh, where's the United States? 25. Uh-oh, Czech Republic, where are you at? <laughs> oh, 49. Savage. Um, yeah, no, that, that feels about right. One of the things I see here all the time is police speeding. I'm just like driving along, like in a 50. And you're driving along and a police car no lights on just breezes past you like 80 and you're like what the f <laughs> what the f police <laughs> oh uh, we are off the rails where are we okay from what i can gather even their own law-abiding citizens are generally wary of cops because simply reporting a crime can reportedly end in a shakedown for the victims oh my god so as you can imagine if a child killer like javad iqbal put himself fully at the mercy of the lahore police force especially after humiliating them so badly he was probably set to follow his teenage servant right out of the interrogation room window i don't see the problem that's if he even made it that far yes for sure uh i think that would that would happen by the way this list only has 179 places even though there's like 190 countries or whatever because a lot of them are tied and i want to know what did we say pakistan was 124 yeah, it's oh okay. I guess Callum looked up the up-to-date figures, along with whoa Mexico. No mama's way. That is poor. I thought Mexico would be doing a lot like that. You are down there. I mean, Mexico's. It doesn't feel like should Mexico be down there with like Pakistan and Azerbaijan and Gabon, Gabon? Really? <laughs> Russia. <laughs> yeah, Russia. This is fascinating, but this isn't a podcast about Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, is it? So let's move on, because I'm getting bored, and you're probably border. Border? More bored. 
Surrendering to a newspaper who was sure to break the story to the public would at least ensure he made it to a courtroom rather than a roadside ditch. Towards that end, he provided the journalists with a 32-page journal outlining further details of his crime, complete with images of the victims for identification. In return, they agreed to call the army to take him away rather than the police. A videotaped confession filmed that day at the newspaper office would go on to form the backbone of the trial of the century, which, as I mentioned right at the start, would end with one of the most jaw-droppingly brutal sentences handed out in the modern age. An eye for an eye, an acid bath for an acid bath. The authorities wasted no time in bringing the case to trial. After all, oh my god, I'm just putting it together now. I'm so slow. <laughs> like, he, they're punishing him with an acid bath because that's what he did to his victims. They were dead though first, right? I think they were. I think that was mentioned. So they're going to just execute him in a normal way and then dispose him in an acid bath, right? That feels like less crazy. The authorities wasted no time in bringing the case to trial. After all, Javad had saved them a hell of a lot of admin work with his detailed confessions and his neatly labeled hordes of evidence. Just five weeks after his dramatic surrender, his case was being heard by Judge Ala Bukush, Bukush Ranchar. Careful with the pronunciation there, Simon. One slip up and you're automatically a massive racist. Ah, oh, I'm definitely a massive racist. <laughs> The accused maintains a cold and indifferent stare throughout the proceedings, often tossing in contradictory statements to his version of events, meaning that his story shifted every other day. He had repeatedly admitted to the killings without remorse, but at times he made himself out to be the victim of a police conspiracy. After all, there was no direct physical evidence to definitively link him to the crimes. I mean, the acid skeletons in his house didn't look great, but just ignore the acid skeletons and he's got a point. Yes, it's, it's quite difficult to ignore acid skeletons when you're investigating a crime, though, isn't it? Mr. Iqbal's defense team even argued that some of the victims had allegedly, ki had allegedly killed weren't even dead. They'd just run away once again, which is a lot easier to argue when the remains were poured into a river months ago. Regardless, the depth and number of his confessions won out in the end. Why are you trying to defend him? Why is there a defense being put on? That doesn't make any sense. Surely he's pleading guilty. Like, why are they... Why is this even going on? It should be like guilty and please don't put me to death in exchange. I mean, right? Those were enough for the court to find him guilty on all 100 counts of first degree murder. Usually, you just expect some ludicrously long jail term as a result or something else symbolic. But that's not how Judge Alabusha Ranger, oh, I'm so racist, rolls. On March the 16th, he convened the court for a sentencing and dealt out a punishment that would ring across the entire world. Javad Iqbal has been found guilty of 100 murders. The sentence is that he should be strangled 100 times. His body should be cut into 100 pieces and put in acid, as he did with his victim. Old Javad must, have son, must suddenly be wondering if he shouldn't have just taken his chances with the cops in the first place. That quote doesn't even convey the brutality of what was in store for our convicted child killer. Wait, it doesn't? Because that seems extremely brutal. His death was be to be a full public recreation of his own crimes. He would be brought out to a park in central Lahore before a crowd made up of the parents of all his victims. He would then be strangled over and over again with the exact chain that he'd used for the murders. Once his body gave out, the 100-piece dismemberment was meant to represent each of the deceased, and each of them would be dissolved in the same chemicals he had disposed of them with. That is a punishment lifted straight out of the seventh circle of hell. Did they really do this? This is so crazy. And also, if the if I if one of if I was one of the vic parents vic of the victims for this, I wouldn't f go to this. I'd just be like, just kill him. I don't want to watch. Just or put him in prison forever. I don't want to just do that. There's no need to be. Let's not. What the. F and let it sink in that this came from a qualified, well-respected judge, not the comment section of the DailyMail.com. Justice, very nice, Callum, very nice. Justice Ranger had got to be has got to be the most gloriously bloodthirsty magistrate since Judge Dredd. Poor little Javi never stood a chance. Justice for Javi. No, 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 just no. No. And a moment of silence, please, for his defense lawyer. As the counsel to a self-admitted mass murderer, Javid's defense couldn't have been ex couldn't have expected for this whole ordeal to go particularly well. But Jesus Christ, when your client is scheduled to be publicly strangled and turned into human soup, that's surely got to be one of the low points of your career. Good Lord, why are you taking this case? And why are you just not pleading guilty? For f sake, man. A change of tune. 
Immediately, the killer's legal team announced that they'd be appealing the decision. <laughs> surprise, surprise! And Javad himself doubled down in his bizarre pleas of innocence. With such a gruesome men staring him right in the face, he decided to pull out the greatest legal trump card there is. And that was the... It was just a prank bro defense. <laughs> Dude. Yes, now Jafad's story got more bizarre and inconsistent than ever before. He attempted to recant his entire confession, explaining that he'd fabricated the entire affair for a good cause. He wanted to draw attention to the plight of Pakistan's steep street children by staging the murder of a hundred innocents using details drawn from Western detective books. Wait, so he's saying that he's saying that he didn't do anything? Uh, mate, I don't know what your lawyer's been smoking, but it might be crack. Oh, I see. So he was actually an advocate for the street kids who had been abusing for decades. It was the parents who were neglectful. Oh, that's it. I see. I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for the two in the vats of the acid in vats of acid as his house as well. Maybe they slipped. My mistake, Javad. Sorry, this was all a big misunderstanding. Off you go, old chap. Except no. In fact, I'm surprised you weren't appointed a UNICEF ambassador for all of those years of tireless activism somehow the court wasn't as sympathetic to this plea as i am <laughs> not really though are we callum javad was condemned to death row alongside the oldest of his accomplices 17 year old sajid ahmed and he was sentenced to die alongside him as for the two young teenagers caught cashing the check they were also found guilty for their part in as many as 13 of the killings as described in the diaries nadim the older boy was sentenced to 182 years behind bars while shazad received 63. good lord Compared to the fate of their greasy, twisted ringleader, a lifetime behind bars doesn't sound too bad after all. I don't know. I don't imagine Pakistani jail is a picnic. The last days, I know, <laughs> maybe death is better. The last days of Javad Iqbal. Now, I'm sorry to disappoint some of our more psychotic listeners, but the remainder of this episode will not, in fact, be a play-by-play -play account of a man's harrowing, afternoon-long execution by the Pakistani state. If that's what you're looking for, I'm sure there's a dark corner of the web somewhere that can accommodate. Oh my god, they actually did it. I assumed that some higher-up court is going to be like, Yo, judge, what are you up to? <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. We'll just gas him like we do everyone else, or hang him, or give him an injection, or electrocute him, I don't know. There's a million of, I don't want to say humane, but semi-humane ways that we kill people. What are you up to? But no, nope, they were like, go for it, chaps. At this point, our story actually takes a bit of a U-turn because of one little technicality. Judges don't actually have the power to dissolve people in acid. Oh, okay, so maybe this isn't happening. I'm confused. Wait, I thought, okay, let's see. Judge Allah Buksha Ranja claims that his judgment was in keeping with traditional Islamic law, which would theoretically lend it credibility in this deeply religious country. I don't think Islamic law specifies that you can dissolve him in acid. I mean, I, I can't say I'm particularly a fay with Islamic law, but I don't, I don't think that would make an appearance. But before you whip out your granddad's UKIP reset, I should point out that dissolving the corpses of convicted convicts is very much not halal. Don't take my word for it, it was actually Pakistan's Council of Islamic Ideology who stepped in to cool the jets of our bloodthirsty judge. See, the Quran is apparently pretty specific about the treatment of dead bodies and doesn't look fondly upon their desecration. Neither does the International Human Rights Commission, which Pakistan's government is a signatory of. So, with the combined backing of the clergy and Pakistan's interior minister, Moina Din Haider, the overkill execution was overturned. Javad Iqbal would still be facing the death sentence, but without all the spectacle and showbiz. Instead, he'd be hanged behind closed doors and disposed of by more traditional, less corrosive means. Good. Yeah, great. Kill him. Normally. Don't be, a, don't be weirdos about it. Perfect. A late night discovery. And so, Javad Iqbal was sent to await his end in Kot Lakapat prison. There, he and his teenage servant remained for a year and a half after, before their sentences were carried out a little prematurely, as it appears, by their own hands. In the small hours of October the 8th, 2001, a guard tasked with patrolling the cell block where Javed and, Javed and Sakid were imprisoned decided to take a nap mid-shift. When he woke, he discovered that on the next patrol that two of the prison's most important prisoners were hanging by their necks, dangling from the bedsheets tied to the iron window bars of their cells. Apparently, this was just the latest in about a dozen attempts, and judging by the burst blood vessels in Javed's face, this time he had succeeded. Wait, there's a prison cell, and in that prison cell there is a bedsheet. There are bars that hang from the, uh, the there are bars from the windows. This seems like they're just asking people who are suicidal to hang themselves. Shouldn't we not, and if they've attempted this before, 
shouldn't we maybe take away the bed sheets or like i don't know attach the bed sheets more firmly or uh i don't know anything to maybe stop them from hanging themselves would have been helpful although i mean also good riddance the night watchman panicked knowing that he would be strung out to dry by his superiors for letting the country's most hated killer dodge his date with the hangman ah uh, yeah i mean but also he's dead so who cares so he did the only thing he could he opened up the cells brought the bodies down and tucked them back into bed all nice and cozy <laughs> dude how do you think this is gonna end what are you up to <laughs> <laughs> he then clocked off for the night without filing a report and left the bodies for the warden to find in the morning at uh, morning roll call mate i i don't mean to i i like i've not seen a body that's been hanged but i'm gonna bet like there's burst blood vessels in his face as we discussed there's gonna be some notable marks around his neck and the fact that they're both dead in this way they're gonna know my dudes <laughs> they're gonna know what are you up to apparently he was supposed to assume the two killers had got tangled up in their pillowcases and apparently strangled to death in their sleep i'm not sure it was an awful plan from the outset so obviously the guard had to admit to his slapdash cover-up and was fired on the spot well that's the official version of events anyway once the coroner had conducted an autopsy of the bodies, there were suggestions that foul play might have been involved in the deaths. Both men were bleeding from the nostrils, and their necks were smeared with blood. On top of that, he recorded that countless head wounds inflicted with a blunt weapon were also found all over the body of Javad Iqbal. Well, in that case, it seems extremely likely that someone absolutely bludgeoned the shit out of him and then hung his body, body up by a bed sheet to make it look like he killed himself. And I mean, I don't want to sound very... Uh uh blase what's the right word here like uh, not caring but uh hang on oh no was that sarcasm were these just the symptoms of everyday beatings from which a suicide or javad was trying to escape or had someone employed by the prison finally gone too far and staged the suicides after the fact to cover up their own crimes all we can do is speculate in the end both deaths were ruled genuine accident genuine suicides they weren't suicides these guys they got this guy got beaten the shit out of to death and then they they strung up his body oh no wrap up and that was the end for javad iqbal not the quite the gruesome spectacle that was threatened by that slightly unhinged judge but a violent end nonetheless until the very end this unrepentant child killer saw himself as a hero fighting back against the injustice of the state and while pakistani justice certainly has some questionable aspect the idea that these can be righted by brutal mass murder of a hundred innocents is probably one of the most pathetic serial killer delusions that i've ever come across especially for this guy because like yeah of course there's many problems with the justice system as there is in any country but in this in his case it was like no 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 it's the justice system catching up to you for crimes that you committed early on and now you want revenge for that like his mum died while he was in prison but it was he was entirely justified to be in prison because he was a pedophile child killer obviously <laughs> Even more frustrating is the fact that it was so damn easy for him to pull off. A perfect storm of police incompetence and public indifference meant that the victims were completely at the mercy of this vicious killer. The sad reality is that he's not the only one targeting these young people. The 1.5 million street kids of Pakistan, many of whom are refugees from neighboring Afghanistan, are among the world's most vulnerable children subjected to exploitation on a daily basis. So if some of the more tragic elements of today's episode hit home for you, then you might want to think about donating to some of the projects which support and protect these kids while they find their feet in life save the children and human appeal both operate in the country and they're a reliable place to start dismembered appendices one reason Jafar was able to get away with his crimes for so long was that he was a master manipulator in 1983 his family started questioning why he wouldn't let them marry him off and he shocked them with a surprise engagement to the sister of one of his victims oh my dude with that one move he succeeded in shutting his family up and keeping the victim under his control he actually pulled off this stunt twice within a few years yeah whatever you want to say about the guy he was obviously a master of getting people to do whatever he wanted except for that judge who sentenced him to be cut into a hundred little pieces and put into acid that didn't work on that guy because he's a judge a crazy judge but a judge number two our man jabby didn't always have such a strained relationship with the cops part of his tactics used to be keeping friends in the local pd he even once used his wealth to fund a magazine in which he gushed over their heroic crime fighting deeds yeah it's always a lot more fun when it's not your own skull getting cracked with a baton right javad if you're a fan of lollywood what is that oh that's lahore's answer to bollywood 
Uh, I'm, pro I I'm not a fan of Bollywood, so I doubt I'm going to be a fan of Lollywood. Lollywood is Lahore's answer to Bollywood. Bollywood is Lahore, uh, India's answer to Hollywood. You'll be pleased to hear that there's currently a Javad Iqbal biopic in the works for release next year. Well, that's if it can get past the censors. Apparently, they're a bit touchy about the idea of allowing a big-budget flick portraying one of the darkest episodes in Pakistani history. Maybe throw a couple of light-hearted musical numbers in to take the edge off. Oh no, <laughs> don't do that. That just makes it worse. Does that mean they'll be like dancing like there is in Bollywood? This seems wildly inappropriate. When he was being led out of the newspaper office, Javad remarked how easy it was to dispose of the bodies and commended himself for bringing this to the attention of police, saying, What if terrorists learned of these things? God forbid they might do something awful, like kill a hundred people. Good thing you killed a hundred people first to prevent them. Right, Javi? Right? This has been an episode of The Casual Criminals, possibly our worst criminal yet. What an absolute piece of uh, if you enjoyed it, smash that like button. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this in its podcast form, please do consider leaving it a review. That would be very kind of you. It uh, it makes me feel warm inside, which is always nice after one of these episodes where it's like, oh, oh, oh. Well, that's depressing. Uh, thank you for listening or watching, and I'll see you next time.